Andrew Leopold, From Avenging Angel to Begging for Them. Summary about a young man from Sharpsburg and Shepherdstown who war changed into an avenging angel of death but who at the foot of the gallows found God. Chapter 1. Little Left to Do But Die What is a mother to do? Polly Zittle's 22-year-old son Andrew, soon to be hanged, had much to consider in his solitary cell in the deepest sanctum of Fort McHenry Prison near Baltimore. Warmaker Andrew T. Leopold had in his hands a small book that he hoped he could put in the hands of another prisoner who, unlike him, would leave the prison upright and alive. The crash of battle shells, the crushing of bones like lath and cries, the groans, the clash of sabers, the shrieking thrill of musketry, the shattering in general, had unleashed something fierce in Andrew, something native to the gun. This one-time crewmate on a lazy Potomac canal boat, who a young girl named Mary described as well-built, straight as an arrow, not handsome of face, but with an honest, grave face that one knew how to trust. Andrew wrote in his cell on the blank leaves of Glimpses of Heaven or The Light Beyond Jordan. My dear and kind loving mother, it is with the deepest sorrow that your humble son has to report to you the sad news of my unfortunate and much unexpected fate which is deemed for me by now. But be of good cheer. I have good grounds to think and hope that I go to a better world, for I have cast myself on the mercies of our God. I write this hoping you may get this book and hope the gentleman who finds it may send it to you. May God be merciful to you is the prayer of your unfortunate son and brother. Robert Baylor, the prisoner there from Charlestown, also condemned to death, who had his commuted less than 10 days after Leopold's last, wrote in his diary that Glimpses, the name of Leopold's book, had been underlined by Andrew at many pertinent poetic lines. Chapter at 2, 1859 boy Leopold's River of Peace. Andrew's quiet days just before the war years on the deck and towing the lines for a canal boat are best put by a fellow boatman in the year 1859. Only the most inaudible ripple of the boat in the water, the distant click of a mule's feet, the purring of the river, the hum of the insects, and occasionally the chirp of a bird broke the stillness. It was almost an ideal state of repose. The days drifted by as a dream, and as I look back it was a very tranquil dream. Day ran into day, sunshine into sunshine, with no care or thought for the morrow. Chapter at 3, 1860, Leopold becomes transfixed on the god of war. Andrew comes face to face with a mortal god of war, General Jeb Stuart. Attention, Stuart cried, now I want to talk to you, man. You are ignorant of this kind of work and I am teaching you. I want you to observe that a good man on a good horse can never be caught and a gallop is a gait unbecoming a soldier unless he is going toward the enemy. Chapter 
Chapter at 4, July 21st, 1861, Leopold the Reckless Invincible. Soon, at the first battle of Bull Run, Manassas, Leopold was among the 150 men in the 1st Virginia Cavalry doing what Stuart said. Thundering, galloping, steam nostril, horse weight hurling toward the panicked red scarlet uniformed men in the New York Zoavs, fleeing to anywhere, raised sabers at them. William Blackford remembered the tremendous impetus of horses at full speed broke through their line like chaff before grain. Leopold was seeing the elephant. The phrase of all soldiers before beholdings war's immediate unhinged horrors. William Morgan put it this way to his wife. By dawn at Bull Run, the conflict began with the boon of artillery and the sharp reports of musketry mingled with the hoarse commands given by the officers, the screams of the dying horses, and the groans of the wounded, all which kept up without intermission until moonlight. It seems Leopold emerged from such trial a changed man. August 30th, 1862. Leopold the Avenger at 2nd Manassas and Bull Run reported Brigade Commander Brigadier General Beverly Holcomb Robertson. Sergeant Leopold of the 12th Virginia Cavalry was in the thickest of the fight and acted most gallantly during its continuance. He was wounded in three places. Leopold had raced with General Robertson's brigade and the regiment of Colonel Thomas Munford to the extreme right of their Confederate position, hoping with the support of four batteries of horse artillery to block the retreating Union men at Lewis Ford. Leopold's commander, Colonel Asher Harmon, wrote, I found the enemy occupying the hill to the right of the Lewis House with the 1st West Virginia Cavalry, supported by the 1st Michigan Cavalry, drawn up about 200 yards in their rear. Leopold and others in wedge-like form dashed headlong toward the battle line of blue, and as the apex of the swiftly moving mass was about to pierce the center of the Federal line, their line wavered for an instant, then broke and fled in every direction. Harmon wrote, the 12th Cavalry charged the regiment on the hill and drove them back on their support, which were in quick succession broken and driven back in complete disorder. I pursued them over the run and as far as the pike near the stone bridge, capturing many prisoners, among them Colonel Thornton Broadhead, commander of the 1st Michigan Cavalry. Someone with Leopold later wrote, the West Virginia Federals broke and ran and we were after them with pistol and saber. A member of the 4th New York noted, the Secesh used their revolvers with a determination to slaughter some of our lads. Captain William Porter Wilkin of the 1st West Virginia remembered seeing our comrades mowed down by their sabers and the deadly fire of their musketry and cannon. The last Federal commander still on the field Colonel Thornton Broadhead, commander of the 1st Michigan Cavalry, fell into the hands of Leopold's Cavalry Regiment and brought to Adjutant Lewis Harmon at the Ford. Harmon demanded Broadhead's surrender, and when Broadhead refused, Harmon shot and mortally wounded him. Harmon rode off with Broadhead's horse, saddle, pistols, and saber. Stewart exulted in his official report of the campaign that at Lewis Ford over 300 of the enemy's cavalry were put hors de combat, they, together with their horses and equipments, fallen into our hands. Stewart bragged about his victory, stating, Nothing could have equaled the splendor with which Robertson's regiment swept down upon a force greatly outnumbering them, thus successfully indicating the claim for courage and discipline. 
through this, a one-time canal boat boy was not at peace. Andrew Leopold's blood, as they say, was up. But all she said as she passed his bed, young man, I think you're dying. 